Hey guys, welcome back. Skitzone series episode nine. Topic today is timing things. You can't hear it, but this watch is ticking at five ticks a second. This is my, uh, my, I think it's Vostok Komandirsky. I probably butchered that pronunciation pretty bad. Um, I can't even read these hieroglyphs, but yeah. So we're gonna talk about how to time things. Let's say you wanted to benchmark your code, profile part of your code. Um, how would you go about doing that in x86-64 assembly? Let's say you wanted a timestamp value for some reason. Let's say you wanted to have a file be saved by a function and it just happens to save the file with a file name for the timestamp, right? That's not an uncommon use case, right? So how would you go about doing that? How would you count the number of cycles that have elapsed and also seconds that have elapsed on your processor since you know something happened? And also how would you time a delay? Let's say you wanted to do something every five seconds. How would you implement that kind of a delay in assembly? So we'll talk about those things today. Now there are a lot of ways to time things. Um, some are more or less portable. Some are better and worse. These are probably somewhere in the middle of the road. I think these are two of the more common ways that you track time. Um, and I'm gonna do two different ways. One is a syscall called get time of day, which is available both on Linux and FreeBSD. And that basically returns, even though it's not a return value, it, it returns a timestamp, which is counting number of seconds and microseconds since the epoch, which is some period of time. I think it's like 1970 or something like that. It's like a boomer a boomer date. Uh, and then there's the RDTSC instruction that would be available on a more of a, even on a bare metal implementation. Um, and that returns the number of cycles since the CPU was reset. And uh, they seem different, but I think we'll show one of the, in one of the examples to come that they're not really all that different. They're just giving you different outputs. Okay, so going into that instruction, there's kind of three main things that you should know from the documentation. The first is obviously that the processor monotonically in increments this timestamp counter every clock cycle and resets it to zero when the processor is reset. So yeah, that's what it says. So basically when CPU turns on, it's supposed to be like zero. And then when you query it later, it will tell you the number of clock cycles that have taken place since it turned on. The opcode is 0F31, and the instruction is just RDTSC, as I've showed before. And what it does is it returns the timestamp counter value, that 64-bit quantity, into two registers. Um, the high 32 bits goes into EDX, and the low 32 bits goes into EAX. And uh, basically, you can just shift them around if you want to put them together and make one big number. Or if you only care about the low 32 bits, let's say it's a very short thing that you're timing, um, you know, you can worry about that only in EAX. But the problem with that is that what if you overflow EAX during your during your time, then you won't know, you'll have a negative quantity that's elapsed if you were to subtract that. So yeah, I would always take the full 64-bit value. There's no harm in doing so nowadays. We have 64-bit processors in the first place. And then uh, lastly is that CPUs don't really do things sequentially in my understanding at least not exactly some things are happening while other things are taking place and so it's not this is not like a i think it's called a serializing instruction basically you have to if you really care about getting an accurate measurement of the time that's taking place or what the current timestamp quantity value is you have to call these other instructions called l fence and m fence which basically ensure that all the other previous loads and stores respectively have taken place. Okay, that's pretty much it. Very simple stuff. And so how you use that, or how I'm gonna use that at least, is I'm going to call LFence to make sure all the instructions are finished. I don't really care about stores, but instructions at least, I wanna get some level of accuracy here. And then I'm just gonna call the RDTSC value, uh, instruction that's going to put that timestamp quantity into EDX and EAX. And here you can see I'm shifting the Rx value left. So these 32 bits are going to be moving into these 32 bits. And then we're gonna place them into Rx with this OR instruction here. So at this point, we'll have a full 64-bit value in Rx that's been read from the timestamp counter on the processor. So yeah, pretty cool, pretty easy. Now, Patrick had a good question, and he's wondering, 
how do I know if my CPU supports instructions like this? And actually, um, Patrick's not the only one that asked this question because L1Q in the comments brought this up as well. And he was, had a very good point in the previous video. Um, I was using these two different random integer generating uh, instructions, RD seed and RD rand on the processor. And those are not you know, pervasive, I guess. I guess older processors 10 years plus ago wouldn't have had, had those instructions. And so how do you check if a processor even supports those instructions? Is there a way in software to check? And the answer is yes. Or you can just follow this flow chart. So basically you ask yourself, are you a boomer? Have you walked this earth for hundreds of years now? If the answer is no, then you probably have a new PC and so it probably supports this instruction. But if you are a boomer, you have to ask yourself, are you in destitute poverty? If no, you probably have a new computer and so again, your CPU probably supports this instruction. It's been around since the Pentium, obviously. But if you are poor and a boomer, then you have to run the CPU ID instruction to check for support. Now, what is this CPU ID instruction? Well, I don't really know, but from what I can tell, this basically is just a, a way to allow software to discover details about the processor on which it's running. And so you can pass in a what's called a CPU ID leaf number into EAX. And that just basically means I'm looking for a certain category of things about the processor. Give me all that you know about yourself. Um, and so we're going to pass in EAX equals one to get some different feature information about the processor into two registers, EDX and ECX. And in this case, you can see we can check for a bunch of different stuff. We can check for the FPU support. We can check for SSC3 floating point instruction support. We can check for all this different stuff. In this case, we're going to be checking for the TSC support. That is the timestamp counter and also the associated RDTSC instruction. And to do so, it's very simple. All we do is, as you can see, we pass in um, CPU ID EAX of one to get kind of these bits set up and many more bits. I, I've cut it off here, obviously, just for space um, into EDX and ECX. And then you can see here these bottom two lines. I'm just testing if that fifth bit is set to high. And that would indicate that this TSC is supported. And if it's not supported, if that's low, I'm going to just be jumping somewhere else in my code and saying, hey, by the way, that instruction didn't work or it won't work if we try it. So yeah, this is how you would check if your CPU supports a given feature. So thanks for bringing it up, Patrick and L1Q is a good point. Now the syscall, I would say is, is easier to use in a way um, and also harder to use in a way. And so this syscall is available again on both on Linux and FreeBSD with these syscall numbers. Don't worry about the numbers because they're going to be implemented in the OS specific, and they already are implemented in the OS specific file that is included on your processor whenever you assemble this code. And what it does is it basically it takes two structures and it returns an error value. So it would be zero if it, if it succeeded. Um, and actually of these two parameters, the second parameter is bogus because you don't use it anymore. You can see here that time zone structure is obsolete. So we're just going to be passing in zero or null for that. But the time value address, that's important. It's a pointer to, it's basically the address of um, 16 bytes or 128 bits of space in memory that you're going to use for the syscall to drop in the number of whole seconds and number of microseconds that have elapsed since that 1970s epoch whenever. Um, and so yeah, basically if you run the syscall with these quantities in these registers in this way, <laughs> this dot time value memory location will contain number of seconds and microseconds since the epoch. So very straightforward, I think. With that out of the way, let's hop into the code. Um, I'll move this up so you can see it for now. We have, was that, six examples. Um, I'm going to cover the basic usage of that instruction, RDTSC, and the syscall, get time of day, in examples A and C. I'm going to implement also tick and talk. If you have experience with MATLAB or Octave, tick and talk, which are spelled T-I-C and T-O-C, there are ways you can kind of uh, keep track of the elapsed time that's taken place for blocks of code. It's used for like very 
cursory levels of benchmarking in MATLAB. Um, and so we're going to implement those two sets of instructions in assembly. And we're going to do so both in terms of cycles and also microseconds that have elapsed. So that's cool. Then we have, um, we're going to use those two tick and talks to estimate the CPU frequency of our processor, which is a pretty cool topic and a pretty cool result in there. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about how to do a, a delay, a wait or a sleep function in assembly um, for your purposes. So with that out of the way, let's hop into the code. And first I'm going to hop into the actual functions because I think that's good to cover at first. And so I'm going to first talk about these couple of functions. So I have a function called tick cycles, a function called talk cycles, a function called tick time, and a function called talk time. And so what these do is they just count the number of cycles or microseconds that have elapsed between them. So tick, I call tick, I do some code, I call talk, and it, would, it will basically compute and it will return in REX the number of cycles and or the number of um, microseconds that have elapsed in that block of code between them. So first off is tick cycles. So what this does is it's a function that takes no parameters, but it, re it saves in memory at this location down here and also in REX the number of the timestamp counter at the current instant. And so basically you can see here, I'm calling LFENCE to make sure all the instructions have finished. I'm calling RDTSC to get the timestamp counter value into those two registers, EDX and EAX. I'm shifting them, I'm ORing them. At this point I have in REX the total 64-bit value of the timestamp counter. Then I'm also moving that into this memory address down here which we can access outside this, by the way, even though it's a quote unquote local variable with dot tick, as long as I refer to this memory address as tick cycles dot tick, and as long as I've, I've included this file, I will be able to access that memory anywhere in my code, just by referring to it as tick cycles dot tick. And then lastly, so not only is that value in this address, that 64-bit quantity of the timestamp counter, it's also in REX. So if you wanted it for immediately, you have it in REX for your own purposes. Now, talk cycles is the exact you know, associated uh, function there um, for tick. So this includes tick cycles as a dependency, because obviously we have to have called tick before talk because we're going to be subtracting off that saved value from this, this point in time. And so here you can see it's very simple. Again, we're calling that same RDTSC in exactly the same way. At this point in the code where I'm showing my cursor, we now have the current timestamp counter value in REX. And all we do is we subtract off the previous value. And so in doing so, we now have in REX the number of cycles that have elapsed on the processor since we called tick cycles. Cool. Now, tick time is a very similar uh, process, but instead of using RDTSC, obviously it uses that syscall. And so you can see we're pushing the you know corresponding um, clobbered registers by the syscall, and then we're just calling the syscall, and we're saving that quantity in terms of seconds and microseconds in this tick time dot tick memory address, 128 bits of space. And we're also putting that value in REX, just in case you care about getting the current timestamp uh, quantity, you know, instantly. And then of course in talk site or talk time, again we include as a dependency the associated tick time function that you would have to call first. And all this does is that, again it gets the time the current um, uh, time seconds and microseconds since the epoch and subtracts off the previous. Um, elapsed microseconds down here and uh, returns it in REX. And so at this point, you'll have a number of microseconds that have taken place from talk time since tick time. Lastly, I have the sleep function. This is a very simple function. All it does is you pass in the number of microseconds for which you want this function to just sit there and wait. And we're going to wait basically by just having a loop inside which we are checking the number of the current timestamp. And so we're going to use that syscall again, that get time of day syscall, just to keep checking, hey, has it been 5 million microseconds yet? 
has it been 5 million yet? Has it been 5 million yet? Over and over and over again until the answer is yes. And once the answer is yes, we drop out. So very straightforward. You can peruse the code at your own leisure if you'd like. It's all online on the, the SoyHub suppository. So with that out of the way, let's hop into the examples. So I have six examples. Let's look at the first one first. That's um, just the um, RDTSC instruction. So if I run this, you'll see all it does is it's printing out, oops, oh my God, I'm so dumb. The number of timestamp uh, clock cycles that have taken place since my processor was reset. So it's been however many um, cycles since my processor was turned on. And you can see it's counting up each time a higher and higher number, right? Cool. How does that work? Well, pretty straightforward. First thing I'm doing is I'm actually checking if my CPU supports that instruction, like Patrick suggested. And so you can see I'm just checking that fifth bit. If it's high, I'm, I'm good to go. If not, I'm going to say there's an error message for us. So again, all I'm doing is I'm querying the timestamp counter and I'm printing it out. So if I were to run that again, we'll see that I just get that quantity increasing each time. And if I go back in, and what if I were to change that, that uh, conditional jump to be inverted, right? At this point, I'm kind of simulating the CPU not having support for this instruction. If I run it now, you can see it says that RDTSC is unsupported. Okay, let me change that back before I forget. So yeah, you can, you can successfully check whether or not your CPU supports a given instruction like that. Cool. Next example, I'm gonna talk about example C now, which is that get time of day syscall. And so if I run that from this example function, you'll see that it prints out the number of seconds and microseconds that have elapsed since that, that Unix whatever um, epoch back in the 70s. And so you can see uh, it's going up each time I call the code, call the, yeah, the code. How does this work? Basically, as you would expect, all it does is it calls that get time of day syscall and then prints out the number of seconds, prints out a decimal point, and then prints out number of microseconds. So that's pretty simple. Again, you can see it just prints out that timestamp value. Okay, cool. Um, example B. Now, this is that tick and talk function that you would have in MATLAB or in Octave, but in assembly. And in this case, it's counting not seconds, but it's counting cycles that have elapsed. So if I run this code, you'll see what happens. It basically did a billion loops in 1.2 billion cycles. So in this case, 1.24, 1.30. Is that billion? Yeah. So you can see it's running pretty much more or less at one cycle per loop iteration almost. So yeah. How does this code work? Basically, it's pretty pretty straightforward. We have the number of iterations, 1 billion being saved in a register. We're printing out some stuff in the beginning. Then you can see here's our tick and talk in our loop. So here we're calling tick cycles. This saves that initial uh, timestamp counter value, the cycle count into memory. Then we have our loop for 1 billion iterations right here. We're just decreasing that register by one every loop. And until it's zero, we keep jumping to the top of the loop. At the end of that loop, once it's done, we call talk cycles and that just subtracts off the number of cycles that have taken place and it prints it out here. So again, if I run that code, you can see it prints out, we've elapsed, we've taken uh, 1.2 billion reference cycles to do 1 billion iterations of that loop. Okay, cool. Example D now, um, exactly the same thing, but in this case, it's printing out that same thing, but in microseconds. So not in cycles, but in microseconds now. And you can see it's taken around 400,000 or so, maybe 300,000 or so microseconds to do 1 billion iterations. And so you could actually compute the frequency of my processor if you wanted, and we will do that in the next example as well. So. How does this work? Well, it's exactly the same code, pretty much cut and paste, um, except that we're using two different tick and talks. We're using tick time instead of tick cycles and talk time instead of talk cycles. So this will compute the number of time that's elapsed, number of seconds and microseconds that have elapsed since tick was called and printed out to the screen. And so you can see here, it prints out that quantity as we would expect. Um, example E, 
this is how we're going to estimate the CPU frequency. And um, how do we do that? Let me show you. So you can see here, here is that same exact code. Again, 1 billion iterations of that loop. And you can see at the, at the top of the loop, before it takes place, we have calling both tick time and tick cycles. We have the loop, and then we call talk time and talk cycles. And then you can see we are basically dividing the two and scaling by a million to get our units in hertz as opposed to being in what megahertz or something. Um, and so if I run this, you can see we're basically going to be estimating the processor frequency. And so if I run this code, you can see it's done a billion loop iterations in 3.593 billion hertz. And I can run this as many times as I want. It's always giving the same quantity. Why is it giving the same quantity? Well, first off, what is my CPU quantity? So if I run NeoFetch, you can see my CPU frequency is 3.593 gig. So it's giving the exact CPU frequency. How is, how is it so accurate? How, even though the time is different between each time it calls something, like how, how am I getting the exact quantity every time? If I had to guess, just between you and me, if I had to guess, I would guess that that get time of day syscall is using RDTSC and just multiplying it by some scalar constant to compute the time that's elapsed, even though it's just, it's really measuring cycles that have elapsed, but it's pretending, it's, it's convincing us that it's measuring time, but it's really not. And so in reality, in my opinion, if I had to guess, these two methods, the syscall approach and the RDTSC approach are actually the same thing. So anyway, pretty cool stuff. Um, Lastly, the last example I have was that delay function. And so all I have here, if I go to the code, I think I'm delaying it for 2 million microseconds or two seconds. So all I'm doing is I'm calling sleep with that as the parameter. And then I'm printing out that we've waited so we know when the program's done. So if I run this code, let me um, clear the screen. It takes two seconds to print out that we waited for two seconds, as you would expect. 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000. Perfect. So yeah, with that out of the way, we've covered pretty much everything I wanted to cover, I think. Um, now you guys know how to basically do some pretty basic benchmarking. You know what goes into that syscall and that instruction and kind of how they work behind the scenes. And you can also implement delays and whatever else you want to implement on your own time. No pun intended. Without further ado, I'll do one last thing and that's to plug our top secret Discord um, no norming is allowed. It's in the description, the last link. Check it out if you want to hang out with some of us. Um, yeah, I'll see you guys in the next video.